stays there. She said, and her notes. But what is a, what's a first, what, what is a first cause? It's a cause that is uncaused, right? First cause, uh, by necessity, has to be defined as a cause that nothing else causes, right? When we're talking about a first cause, who is that first cause, or what is that first cause? Well, God himself is the first cause, and in relation to creation, the first cause behind everything is the decree of God, that nothing comes to pass, nothing comes into existence, nothing takes place in God's creation that was not first and foremost decreed by God to take place. And that's just by simple extension, the nature, you know, uh, an extension of uh, the nature of God and the nature of creation. Creation, by definition, is dependent at all times upon its creator. Right? God created this world, but God not only created it and then spun it like a top and just let it spin on, God also sustains it, right? Then the God who sustains it has to keep everything uh, functioning according to his design and his purpose for it. And, um, therefore, that's the first cause. What is a second cause? Well, last week we defined a second cause as um, a real cause. I know this gets complicated. Again, put your, put your thinking caps on, drink some more coffee. Actually, we don't have any. We need to get coffee back out there. Okay. If you don't want to have the coffee, you don't have to have the coffee. Um, but the coffee, I think next week we should have the coffee available. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check with others and see if we're willing to do that. But see if we can have that ready for you guys. But a second cause is a real cause that is itself caused by something else. So it is a real cause. That means it's an action that has real effect. It's an action that has real consequence and actually accomplishes something in this world. But it is, it is itself dependent upon another cause. It's dependent upon the first cause. And in this relationship, we know that God's decree is the first cause. And everything else that takes place in God's creation, uh, accomplished by willing creatures, living creatures, that is... A second cause. You guys remember the uh, very helpful and uh, very scholarly illustration that we used last week about the dog? Yes, high-minded ivory tower discussion that we had about the dog. If a dog barks, who or what caused the dog to bark? Was it God that caused the dog to bark? Or was it the dog that caused the dog to bark? Or, if we wanted to extend it out, was it the stimulant, the, the mailman that caused the dog to bark? Which one caused the dog to bark? Well, all of them, in a sense, right? Because a dog can't bark unless God upholds that dog and sustains the abilities that God gave that dog and the properties that define what a dog is, God has to uphold all of that in order for that dog to be a dog. But that dog barked because that dog wanted to bark. There was something in the dog that was driving the dog to bark, right? And so there you have a relationship between first cause and second cause. You have God sustaining the dog, God enabling the dog to bark, God causing whatever stimulant was going on outside to affect the brain, to cause the desires, however you, however you discuss desires in a dog, <laughs> to, to, to cause this will in the dog, whatever that may be, to use its abilities to bark. Now, God caused that to happen because God sustained that dog in, in, in all that it was seeking to do, but the dog also caused itself to bark because it was functioning according to God's purpose and design. And however a dog chooses to bark, that dog chose to bark. I know that's a dumb illustration, but it's the same principle with us as we live our lives before the Lord. We can't do anything unless God has decreed that we will be able to do it, unless God sustains us so that we can do it. And yet at the same time, the decisions and the actions that we take are real decisions and real actions that have consequences and affect changes in this world.
know this might sound complicated. I'm just trying to summarize. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask for the sake of clarity. Um, so that was the first point of the outline that we're talking about. What is a second cause? Now, we're, today we're going to move on into uh, what is known as the doctrine of concurrence. If you want to write that down. Doctrine of concurrence. Or you could write the, the doctrine of compatibility. Then we're going to look at another point, which is discussing further what liberty of second causes means. So after the concurrence, you can write liberty of second causes. And then we're going to end on contingency of second causes. What does that mean? What is that talking about? So concurrence, liberty of second causes, and then finally contingency of second causes. All right. You guys ready? I'm going to read this first paragraph, and then we're going to talk about this doctrine of concurrence. God has decreed in himself from all eternity... <clears throat> by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, God has done that. God has done this so as thereby, God is neither the author of sin, nor does he have fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. All right. Now, as I just tried to summarize, when we're talking about this relationship between first cause and second cause, what we are talking about is known as the doctrine of concurrence. The reality that both the first cause and the second cause are always operating at the same time. Uh, last week, we started looking into this, uh, this cooperation between God's decree and human freedom. Uh, remember Hans last week used the phrase human agency. That's just describing us as creatures under God that have freedom, and God has given us ability of choice. Um, I think it's described, uh, yeah, W.G.T. Shedd, we're going to get to him in a little while, he described this freedom as decreed self-determination. Sounds complicated, but it's very important <laughs> that God has decreed that we as human beings will have self-determination. We determine what we want to do based on what we desire to do, what we think is best uh, in the circumstances in which we are and the desires that are in our hearts. And so as God's decree establishes the reality that all things that come to pass will actually come to pass according to his will, Ephesians 1.11, he is working all things after the counsel of his will. That's God's decree of all things. At the same time, God has decreed that all things will come to pass by means of second causes. Uh, creatures who choose to do what they want to do, and yet in choosing what they want to do, fulfill the very will that God has decreed to happen, or the, the things that God has decreed to take place. Those two realities are operative at all times in any event of which we're speaking in creation. So Burkhoff, we, we looked into this last week. Burkhoff says of this that each deed is entirely both a deed of God and a deed of the creature. It is a deed of God insofar as there is nothing that is independent of the divine will, meaning nothing can happen unless God wills for it to happen, right? You guys with me? 
Have I lulled you into a, a, a sleep or numbness yet? Or are you awake? Take by the non-answers that you guys are asleep. <laughs> and we need to change up the presentation a little bit. What's that? Was that Eric? God wills for that. God wills for that, yes. Oh, man, you got to stimulate these second causes, get those brains moving. I have a question about yes. that you have a verse for God's disease. Do you have one for that God is second causes? I have one for God's decrees. Do I have a verse for second causes? Yes, and absolutely. And give me just a second. Let me finish recapping. We'll get to where we were last week. Uh, if you want to write this down, where we're going, we've already been to Genesis 45, verse 5. I may just walk through that briefly again uh, for, for those who weren't here. Genesis 45, verse 5, and then Genesis 50, verse 20. And then we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 26 through 30, just as illustrations in the scriptures of both first cause and second cause working together at the same time. Now, Burkhoff, when he was describing this reality of first cause and second cause working, he said that each deed is in its entirety both a deed of God and a deed of the creature. It is a deed of God insofar as there is nothing that is independent of the divine will. And it is the deed of man through the self-activity of the creature. Now, I've been trying to point out as we've walked through this, that both of these realities are presented in Scripture, but they are not um, the difficulty or the mystery that is apparent in both of these realities is not dealt with. You have both realities stated plainly in Scripture or illustrated in Scripture, but n at no time do you see any writer of Scripture seeking to work it out how these two things relate. They're simply stated, right? And so what that means for us is that when we come to this, this point where we're talking about God decreeing all things that come to pass, he being absolutely sovereign over his creation, and how that relates to human freedom and the reality of the will, and, it, and that it matters that we make choices and that we actually do need to rise up in our volition and use our will to do the will of God as it's revealed in Scripture. As we're looking at how these two things relate, we have to keep in mind that there is always going to be this tension of a mystery. We cannot understand how these two things come together, and I am not going to have the answers. No one is going to have the answers for how or the answers that will satisfy our deep questions that we have in relation to these things. In fact, when you try to answer the difficult questions in relation to these two realities, you always wind up going in error on one side or in error on the other. You always wind up diminishing God or distorting the character of God. Or you always wind up exalting man right, and distorting a true understanding of man. You, you cannot bridge the gap on this mystery on this side of eternity. Remember my, uh, the analogy from Charles Spurgeon when he was talking about this very, very, very uh, truth, these very truths. He said that they're like a train track, right? As you're standing in the middle of a train track, you've got the two rails and they're running parallel to one another. They never seem to touch, but both rails are there, right? And the train needs both rails in order to get to where it's going. But when you look down the track and in the distance, uh, you, with linear perspective, right, you begin to see those train tracks come uh, closer and closer together until they reach the point on the horizon where they seem to touch. Spurgeon said that's what it's like when we're talking about the reality of God's sovereignty in relation to human freedom. It's like two train tracks that right now we cannot see how they fit together, how they work together, where they touch. But in eternity, when we get to that horizon point, when we, when we finally reach the end of the track and we are with God in his presence and in his glory, we will see how the two touched in time. But as of right now, we can't understand that. I, I love that analogy. I think it's very helpful. And it's something that we need to keep in mind, especially as we're now dealing with this doctrine of 
concurrence, this doctrine that teaches that both God's sovereignty and human will and freedom are operative at the same time at all times. Right? That they are, they are concurring. They are, there, there are two currents running together. You've got the, the current of God's sovereign will and you've got the current of man's will. Both running the same direction and accomplishing ultimately accomplishing God's decreed will. Uh, hold on, wait for the mic for people uh, who are online. Okay. I was thinking the verse, uh, you are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God lives in you. So what is the difference then in terms of second causes in relationship to a believer and a non-believer? Um, well, I mean, in the substance of it, there's, okay, hang on. Clarify what you're asking. Well, okay, if we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be doing what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. So in one sense, secondary causes are really caused, in essence, by a first causal or the Holy Spirit. So in the same way with a non-believer, they are directed or controlled by the sinful nature and are doing what the sinful nature wants it to do. Yes. Okay, a couple things here. Um, first of all, when the scripture speaks of the influence of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer, it never describes it in a way that makes the believer uh, like a robot or a puppet that the spirit is coming into and then working things out through that person. Like for example, Galatians 5.16, Paul says, um, uh, walk according to the desires of the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, that means that the spirit is putting desires in you, but it's your responsibility to act on those desires, right? Like you, you, you are that when Paul is commanding believers to walk according to the spirit so that they will not gratify the desires of the flesh, he is commanding them to use their will and to act according to you, the desires of the spirit. You know, once you're slaves to sin, but now you're slaves to righteousness. So it seems to imply that there is some type of control. So, yes. There is, there is control, but it's not, it's not control in the sense of God controlling you. It's the, controlling, um, it's the control of a new principle that has been birthed in the heart of the believer. Because in Romans 6, when it talks about being made slaves of righteousness, Paul goes on to say that they became, these believers became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which they were committed. There was something in them that changed desires that change and because their desires changed that motivated them to walk in obedience to righteousness right they became slaves of righteousness because their desires Change. were for righteousness right yeah god changed their heart and because they had changed hearts they had changed affections they had changed motives they had changed desires and therefore became slaves to the and hey, i'm sorry parentheses here it's related but Subpoint maybe is just a better way to describe. Just move it over in your mind. The issue here of control, when we're talking about the will of man, all right, I just had like 50 thoughts go right at the front of my mind. Let me see if I can restrain myself and pull the reins in. All right. When we're talking about the will of man, most people, when they think of free will, they think of man as being able to sovereignly or autonomously decide to do whatever man wants to do free from any element of control or influence in his or her life, right? It's, it's free will. I am autonomous. I can determine for myself of myself what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. That goes too far from what scripture describes and defines as the will of the creature. The will of the creature is free, meaning we are always free to do what we want to do, but therein lies the problem. 
It's always what we want to do that determines what we will do. Right? And this is what Martin Luther meant and John Calvin meant when they spoke of the bondage of the will. That will is not absolutely free in humanity in the way that we would think of God's will being free. Will within man, will within, within us as creatures is determined by the desires that we have. We are in bondage. We are enslaved to our desires. And until our desires are changed, we will never use our will to do anything other than the desires we already have now. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we are always enslaved to ourselves as creatures. If the creature is evil, what does the creature want to do? The creature wants to do evil. And if the creature wants to do evil, what will the creature do? Evil. If God makes us new creatures in Christ, we have been given new hearts, new affections, a new spirit put within us, Ezekiel 36. Then what happens to us now as creatures? We're, we're no longer evil and dead in our sin. We've now been made what? Alive together with Christ. We're alive now. Our hearts are renewed under the grace of the Lord. And we've been given a new operative principle at work in our hearts. It's a principle of godliness. It's a principle of righteousness, a principle that desires to walk after the will of the Lord. And if that's what we are, and if that's what we now want to do, what will we choose to do? So, we will choose to do righteousness. We'll choose to do what's good and right in God's eyes. So, so just so clarify. How, so how do you handle within Romans where Paul says, you know, the very things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do, but it's no longer I who does it, but sin living in me. So there's, a, there's also a battle there where his will wants to do what is right, but he's overpowered by the sin nature that dwells with him. So I won't, say, I won't say that he's overpowered by it, but he's in conflict with it. Mm -hmm. And where Paul, what Paul is describing there, he's already talked about being set free from sin in chapter 6. So he's not enslaved to sin. Sin is no longer master over him because he's not under law, he's under grace. Right? right? He's been made new creatures, he's died with Christ, he's been raised to walk in newness of life. And then in chapter 7, Paul begins to deal with the reality that even as new creatures, we still wrestle against the desires of the old man, right? Now, the old man, when Paul's talking about this wrestle, this struggle that he's having, he, he relegates sin and, and that depra that, uh, the depraved desires that he's wrestling against. He, he confines that to what he describes in verse 7 or verse uh, 24 of chapter 7 where he calls it this body of death, right? It's a body of death that he's wrestling against. It's a law that is at work in his members, his body, that is keeping him captive to the law of sin, right? When not enslaved to it, he's set free from it. But it's, he says, I see it in my, so hang on, just let me read it. That would be far more helpful than me trying to <laughs> bounce back and forth through this. Paul says in verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Okay, so right there, what has happened internally in Paul's life? He wants to do right. So what has happened to his desires? They've been changed. What, what have they been changed to want to do? They've been changed to want to do righteousness, right? So I want to do right, but even when I want to do right, Paul says evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. There's this holy pleasure that Paul is describing that is true for all believers. When they come to the law of God, they have this holy desire in their hearts to do righteousness. To do what is pleasing in God's sight and to be like Him. And yet, Paul says in verse 23, I see in my members... Another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So there's the division, right? We've got this inner man that's been renewed, it has new desires, and we have this other thing that Paul's describing as a law that is at work in my members. Then verse 24, he clarifies exactly what he means. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the, this body of death? And so what Paul's picturing there is not that internally he is held captive to sin, 
but that as he desires to do righteousness according to God's will, he finds in himself that he's wrestling against some principle that is a remnant from the old man. This old man that is relegated to the body of death. His spirit has been renewed, but his body has not yet been made new. And so until the day of resurrection, until that day of glory, he goes on to talk about in chapter 8, he's going to be wrestling against the principle of the old man, striving to put off the old man in order to more fully put on the new. So I don't, I don't know if that, makes, if, that, if that answers. I hope I didn't muddy any waters there. But um, yeah, when we're talking about your point of the Spirit working in the life of the believer, that work of the Spirit is never presented as something that is divorced from the will of the creature. So one of my, my favorite example of this, if you want to write it down, is Philippians 2, 12 and 13, um, where specifically 13, where it says that God is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It doesn't say God is at work in you to cause you to do his good pleasure. It says God is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. There's, there's an influence of God upon the will, of, upon our hearts that leads us to do what he desires for us to do. Is God working sovereignly and in a, and in a sense controlling us unto that end as first cause? Yes, he is. But are we also choosing to do good? Are we also choosing to do what God wants us to do? Yes, we are. Because we have renewed wills that long to do what God wants us to do, right? Um, now, that was only one part that came to my mind in relation to your question. Um, I can't remember the second part, so I'm sorry. Well, I guess the second part was what is, I guess, in terms of second causes, the difference between a non-believer and a, a believer in terms of second causes. Okay. Um, I think what you're asking is what is the difference between the f- God as the first cause in the way that he interacts with the believer compared to the way that God as the first cause interacts with an unbeliever? Yeah. We're gonna, we were going to talk about that. Um, I'll, I think I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Let me see if I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Yeah, we're going to get to that in just a minute. That's going to be uh, in paragraph or chapter five, paragraph six of the confession. We're going to look at that in a minute. But just in summary, God is not actively working in unbelievers to cause them to sin or to continue in their unbelief. God is passing them over and allowing them to do what they want to do. That's, that's the relationship. God doesn't do that with believers. He doesn't leave believers to themselves. His grace is working in their lives to conform them to the image of Christ and to bring them to the point where they are more fully submitting to and living out his will. With the unbeliever, God's not working like that to cause the unbeliever to be less and less conformed to the image of Christ or continue to live a life of sin, God is passing that believer over and, ha- or excuse me, the unbeliever over and handing the o- unbeliever over to do what the unbeliever wants to do. You see that in Romans 1, right? 24, 26, and 28. What did, what did God do to those who rejected the knowledge of him and sought to worship idols? He handed them over. He gave them up to what they wanted to do. And, and that, that's how God, as first cause, works with those who are not believers. He gives them over to do what their sinful hearts want to do. Um, Ms. Marsha, did you have something? Yeah. I, I don't like these. <laughs> yeah. When I was growing up and then when I was a young adult teaching Sunday school, back in the days of flannel graph, they had a flannel graph called Ipsy and Newman. And uh, they had, it's like the same person. Uh, the new man was, they had a large figure, 
and he was all clean cut and wonderful. And then there was uh, him as this smaller character, identical but little. And Ipsy was the guy that was the old man and they had a big one of him and he was all rough and gruff unshaven, the whole deal. And then, you know, yeah, I know. And then they had a, a small one of him. And in the story, um, sometimes Newman was large and Ipsy was little, and sometimes it was reversed. And they based it all, and I don't know what the scripture passages were, whichever one you feed is the one that will grow. And uh, that they're both always existing in the believer. But, uh, you know, you have to have the will then to decide which one you want to be the strong man in your life. Yeah, I, I think that in, in many ways that is a helpful picture, right? That um, the more you feed the flesh, the stronger the flesh is going to be, right? The more you walk according to the desires of the spirit, the the, the uh, more discerning you will be and the more able uh, you will, the more you will grow in walking according to the desires of the Spirit. Yeah, I, I think in some ways I agree with that. Uh, Bill? Isn't the fact that um, isn't the fact that believers sometimes sin proof that we are not puppets of God? And isn't there a sense in which um, the believer is the one who truly has free will because God works in us to love righteousness and to choose righteousness, but not always. We don't, we don't always choose the right thing. Um, and then someday uh, we'll be delivered from that part of us that's in conflict with God, and then we will, that, that'll be almost the consummation hmm. of, of our freedom because we won't have to reckon with that. The believer does not have free will because he always does what he wants to do. It is always wrong. Um, the unbeliever. What's that? The unbeliever. The unbel yeah. yeah, the unbeliever. Yeah, but the believer sometimes doesn't choose right. I mean, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we still have desires of the flesh we have to wrestle against, right? And um, Galatians 5.16, again, even 5.24, Paul goes on to say, uh, 24 or 25, if we live by the Spirit, that is, if we've been made alive by the Spirit, then here comes the command, let us walk by the Spirit, or let us keep in step with the Spirit. Right, that's that relationship in the believer. We've been made alive by the Spirit. Now we have to walk with the Spirit, right? And in there, that's where our will comes into play. Yep. Yeah, and, and man, you're only going to find that day of freedom, the day of glory that we're waiting for. You're only going to find that precious if you are actively engaged in waging war against, the, against your flesh now. Like if you are wrestling against the ungodly desires that are still present within you now, then that day sounds really sweet, right? You see how you, even as believers, you see how ungodly and wretched you are now as those who've been made new in Christ. How much sweeter is it than to think of that day when you will finally be released from that and you will be able to love God freely with all that you are, right? This is, this is an interesting thing. When, you remember when, when David was taking up the offering for the temple? He wasn't going to build the temple, but he was taking up offerings for the temple. I think it's in 1 Chronicles 29 where it describes this. Um, David was taking up offerings for the temple, and the people, it says in verse 9, rejoiced because they freely gave right, to the work of the Lord. They, they, of their own heart and will, they gave of their stuff to the Lord, and that caused them to rejoice. 
that they were freely, there was something in them that was enabling them to freely worship God in that way. Well, that kind of joy is what eternity for the believer is going to be all about. It's this joy of knowing that you are free to give all that you are unto the Lord, and there are no longer any hindrances to that. Finally set free from the body of death that we wage war against now. And yes, and enabled to walk with the Lord. I don't think we're getting very far today. Um, oh well. Oh well. Yeah, amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's try to at least complete some of this discussion of the doctrine of concurrence. These two things working together, God's sovereignty, human freedom. Um, Louis Burkhoff goes on to say, in relation to sin, sinful acts are under God's control and occur according to God's predetermination and purpose, but only by divine permission. Understand what he's saying there? This can be complicated, but let me read that again. Mike, this is getting to your question, right? How does God work with believers? How does first cause relate to believers as opposed to how the first cause relates to unbelievers? Well, in a sense, the first cause still determines what will and will not happen, right? But for the unbeliever who lives this life of sin and sin in these sinful acts, Burkhoff says sinful acts are still under God's control according to his predetermination and purpose, that is, by his divine will, decree, but only by divine permission. He permits it to happen. He doesn't actively work to bring it about. Okay? Only by divine permission so that he does not effectively or efficiently cause men to sin. There's a difference. He doesn't cause sinners to sin. He decrees to permit them to sin. Right? That's, and that's where we must maintain a, a hard distinction there. God is not the author of sin, and he can never be the author of sin. Second causes are the authors of sin, and God has decreed to permit those second causes to commit sin. WGT Shedd says of the permissive decree, the permissive decree of God is a decree not to hinder the sinful self-determination of the creature's will. Did you get that? The permissive decree is God's decree. It's his decision not to hinder the sinful self-determination of the creature's will. And then also to regulate and control the result of that sinful self-determination so it doesn't go beyond what he is choosing to permit. You know, Hitler could have been a lot worse than Hitler was. And you could be far worse than Stalin. Right? You personally, you could, you could make Nero look like an innocent baby laying in his crib. There's evil in you that would cause you, if it were allowed to exercise itself and, and um, manifest itself in this world, if you had every opportunity to let the depravity of your own heart loose as a sinful creature born to Adam, you would make the ungodly of this world pale, pale in comparison, if God allowed you to do that. But why did you not become like a Hitler? Why did you not become like a Stalin? Why, why did Stalin not, why was he not more evil than he was? Or Hitler, or Saddam Hussein, or Osama bin Laden, or fill in the blank, whoever. Seth Beiersdorf. Why, why were we not more evil than we were? Well, because God chose to restrain our evil in order to accomplish his will and his purpose, right? Yeah. Now, the questions, where is this in Scripture? Uh, last week, we were looking at Genesis 45. That's kind of where we ended. So we're just, we're just now picking up where we ended last week. Uh, sorry, guys. But you know what we, were, what we were looking at last week with Joseph and his brothers? Um, I pointed out in Genesis 45... 
really from verses 4 and 4 down, as Joseph's brothers came to him after they had realized who he was, and uh, Joseph has made known himself to his brothers, and now uh, he is seeking to comfort them so that they don't feel overly guilty or despairing of the fact that they sold him into slavery, they treated him wrongly, right? Joseph is saying to his brothers in verse 4, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, notice verse 5, Genesis 45, verse 5. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, right there, you have the relationship between first and second cause clearly presented. What did Joseph's brothers do to send him to Egypt? They sold him. Or, well, they weren't purposely sending him to Egypt, but what did they do? They sold him into slavery. They made a choice, an evil self-determination to sell their brother into slavery, to do wrong to him. But who does Joseph say actually sent him into Egypt? It was God. God sent him into Egypt. It was God's will to bring Joseph to Egypt. How did God decree that he would bring Joseph to Egypt? Through sinful self-determinations. Through sinful actions. Yeah, he goes on to say in verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep you alive, to keep alive for you many survivors. For, verse 8 or so, it was, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now that's, I, I don't know how more clearly this reality could be presented in Scripture than in this situation with Joseph. Who sent Joseph here? Well, in one sense, his brothers did because they did wrong to him. They, they committed evil against him and sold him into slavery unjustly. But who actually sent him here? Well, God did because God had a purpose and God had a plan to preserve life by using Joseph in this way. Now, last week I pointed out what would have happened if any one of the evil things did not take place in Joseph's life. Would he have reached the goal that God had decreed? to bring to pass through Joseph? No. If he hadn't been sold into slavery, right? Wouldn't have happened. If his brothers had been able to fulfill their desire to murder him, wouldn't have happened. If Potiphar's wife hadn't pursued him unjust or uh, uh, seductively and then accused him unjustly because he would not submit to her ungodly designs, if that hadn't happened, Joseph wouldn't have been in prison. If he hadn't been in prison, he wouldn't have been there to hear the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. If he hadn't heard the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer and, and, and hadn't waited for two years in prison until Pharaoh had a dream, he would not have been able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, in which case he would not have been exalted to his high position in Egypt, in which case he wouldn't have had the wisdom from God to preserve life the way God intended to happen, it to happen, right? All these evil things that happened to Joseph had to happen to Joseph in order to bring him to the point that God had decreed to use him to preserve life. So you've got that there, that relationship of God overriding evil, not letting it go beyond the bounds of actually accomplishing what he intends to accomplish through it, which is always for good, always righteous purposes and for the good of his people. Then you see in uh, Genesis 50 verse 20, basically restates this in, in, in other language. As his brothers come to him after their father died, they're terrified because they think that now, since their father's dead, Joseph's going to get retribution on them for the evil that they've done. He hasn't really forgiven them. He didn't really believe what he said to them earlier. He's holding bitterness and resentment against them. Well, Joseph says to them in verse 19, don't be afraid, for I am not in the place of God. I'm not your judge. Joseph says, I'm not here to condemn you as, as if I were God. God is the one who will judge you. You will answer to him for what you did, not to me. And as for you, you meant evil against me by doing this, for sure. I recognize that. But God meant it for good. As I pointed out before, not God allowed it for good. God meant it. He intended it. He planned it. He devised this to come to pass the way it did 
for good. And so there you have first cause and second cause operating together in the same event, even in relation to evil, where God is the first cause, is making sure that he brings his will to pass in spite of evil, even using it to accomplish his ends. And that's just a, a phenomenal reality of uh, demonstration of God's power and wisdom. One more I want to look at here. Uh, we got a couple minutes. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 26 to 30. This is uh, the defeat of King Sihon. You guys remember who Sihon was? King of Heshbon. Verse 26, uh, Moses is recounting what happened whenever they went to war with this king. Moses says, I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, or Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. I will go only by the road. I will turn uh, aside neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money. I'm not going to just eat all your food because I want, I'll pay you for it. Um, you shall sell me food for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. I'll even pay you for the water. Only let us pass through on foot. And, and what he's saying, let us pass in peace. We don't want to have any conflict with you. We don't want to do wrong to you. Let us pass through your land in peace. As the sons of Esau who live in Seir uh, and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me until I go over to the Jordan into the land that the Lord our God is giving us. Now, verse 30. What did Sihon do, king of Heshbon? Well, he would not let us pass, Moses recounts. He says he wouldn't let us pass. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. Now, why did Sihon decide not to accommodate the Israelites and allow them to pass through his land? They promised peace. They said, we'll pay you to let us pass through this land. We're not going to do you wrong. We just want to get to the land that's beyond you. We, we don't want your land. So just let us pass through peace. Why did Sihon decide, ah, I don't think so. We're going to war. Well, there were probably a number, of, a number of things that were going on during that time. You had all these different wars and all these different fighting uh, factional elements that were taking, or, uh, situations that were taking place in the land at this time. It was a pretty tumultuous time whenever God was bringing Israel into the promised land. All their neighboring nations were warring against each other as well. So maybe some of that was going on. But ultimately, Sihon chose to go against their uh, desire. He chose not to submit to that because he didn't want to. Right? He despised these Israelites who were coming among them. He decided that he would go to war with them. But what was the ultimate cause for that? Why did he choose not to? Well, ultimately, it was because God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. So what's, what's, who's the first cause here? Who's the first cause? God. How does God cause the second cause? How does, God, how does this first cause relate with the second cause? What did God do to his heart? He hardened his heart. Now, was that unjust for God to do that? Was it wrong for God to harden this man's heart? so that he would ultimately be judged and fall, condemned under the hand of Israel? It wasn't wrong for God to do that. Was Sihon a sinner? Was he an innocent God worshiper who was out there just minding his own business and praising the Lord and, and just in awe of God's creation and giving God the glory that God deserved? And then all of a sudden, God decides, you know, I think I'm done with you. I'm going to wipe you out. Is that how it worked? No, it's not how it worked. If you know anything about these people, they were wretched people. Child sacrificing, homosexuality endorsing, you know, uh, marriage destroying, <laughs> no boundaries, lawless, uh, immoral people. It sounds very much like our country today. Right? And God was not unjust in judging them by hardening his heart. Now, what does it mean for God to harden his heart? It simply means that God gave him over. 
to what was already there. That evil principle was already in his heart, and the Lord just handed him over to act on it. And so, here you have God's intention to bring Sihon to judgment through Israel. And he does so by Sihon's own willful obstinance, right? His own hardened heart, acting upon his own hardened heart. Now, there's one more example that I wanted to bring out, and we'll end on this, and I won't take you through these passages and and draw it out too long, but Sam Waldron uh, says in, in his commentary on the confession, he says at this point that God is not the author of sin because he does not by his own immediate causation bring sin to pass. It is the responsibility of the second cause who willingly engages in sin. This is illustrated by Uh, God's decreeing that David should sinfully number Israel. Do you guys remember what happened when David numbered Israel? What happened then? The Lord sent pestilence among Israel and judged the nation because of David's act. Now, if you go to 2 Samuel 24, verse 1, it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he, meaning the Lord, And he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So the Lord was angry with the people, and the Lord incited David to go number them so that God would bring judgment upon them. Now here in this this verse, it's all in the hands of God. God is the one doing this. He's the one inciting. He's the one bringing the judgment. Now you go to 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1. And it says this, referring to the exact same event, it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So 1 Samuel 24, 1, or 2 Samuel 24, 1, it's God who incites David to number Israel. 1 Chronicles 21, 1, it's Satan who incites David to number Israel. Well, which one is it? Is it God or is it Satan? It's both. And, and, and here's another illustration of this doctrine of concurrence. God was bringing judgment against the people of Israel, and he decreed to do that because of their sin. But he used means to accomplish his ends, which was the ungodly means of Satan. He allowed Satan to incite David in order to accomplish his will. Now, that was much briefer and shorter and not as fully as I wanted to walk through that, but we need to end. So, sorry guys, next week, next week, by God's grace, we will pick up on liberty and contingency, finally. So, let's pray as we end. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the time that we've had to discuss it. God, I, I feel the different struggles in my own heart to understand these matters, especially this morning. But God, I know that your word is true. And I know that you have revealed truth to us so that we would know how to walk with you in faith. So please help us, Lord. May our discussion this morning lead to a lifestyle of fuller faith, more realized faith in our lives. Lord, help us trust in you as the sovereign God. And help us own our responsibility to walk according to the Spirit and to do the will of our Father who is in heaven. God, give us grace to do that. Give us wisdom to understand what your will is and the understanding that we need to live it out. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for your time.